It's so tasty too. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Everybody. Welcome to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. We are the Focus Group here every Wednesday via our stream on uh, Facebook. And then uh, you can find us any, just about anywhere, including YouTube and TuneIn and all the other places, iHeartRadio. Spotify. Uh, Spotify, you name it, Amazon. You can go to focusgroupradio.com and follow and like us on your platform of choice. You'll also find our podcast there, which is TFG Button, which is released each Tuesday. Then, of course, this show, which is a video cast, is re-released as audio on Saturdays. John, I had to laugh when, you know, you gave me credit for doing these openings. You know, some of these... Um, on, on, on Button, yeah. On I usually button. do give you credit. Do you, do you know where It's it's So Tasty too comes from? It's So Tasty It's So too. Tasty too. Tastes no, just like it, candy. Is it... No, where is it? I love Lucy when she does vitamin and vegemite. It's so tasty too. So I was trying to figure out, you know, there's one story here which is a little bit seedy, and uh, so that I'm that I'm going to be doing and caught my eye. So I, I was trying <laughs> to figure out a way so that the kids could still listen. If you have kids in your car, you might not want to have them or or in your stream. You might not want to listen to the one story, but we'll we'll see. So it was my caught my eye this week. Okay, so a couple little banter things for you. Um, Last weekend was obviously the end of daylight savings time. It always pisses me off. Why don't we just stay on normal time, right? Of course, the days wouldn't be as long in the summer. You can move I to Indiana. You can move, yeah, or Arizona. Arizona or Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii, I think, or there's a couple states that don't recognize it, or Europe, because yeah. some don't. And, you know, I had a reminder in my calendar pop up that last weekend, this past weekend, was none other than Shaq's birthday. Remember Eshaq oh, Clayton, yes. who used to be one of our call screeners with an amazing voice. Yeah, yeah, so the really happy deep birthday, voice. Shaq. Yeah. Yes. And people Everybody loved, loved him. And Shaq. Tim and I always tell the story. Shaq was perpetually late. So he would come in five or ten minutes after the show started. No big deal because we were just talking and getting the show going. The one day our producer was flying, I thought Katie was coming, She's coming back coming in from, from Hawaii. Hawaii, She's coming right? From Hawaii. And she yeah. she got up late. She had to come downtown by train. The whole bit. She was running late. She was panicking. We had no one. We didn't know how to turn on some of this equipment, the the master board. And Shaq got there early, like he was like five. The first time minutes. and only time ever, <laughs> right? <laughs> And he's like, well, you know, I'm going to try this. Gonna, and he somehow found a code to unlock the board. And we went on at the precise moment. Within he 15 ran, seconds, I think. Remember? It, because, was, it was, yeah. You know, with those live shows on, on satellite, they had to go. You had to go. It triggered, right? And mm -hmm. that's how you and I got paid. You and I got paid by our sponsors. And so we're thinking, oh, my God, how are we going to get yeah. around this? And, and, Shaq saved and the then day. Katie comes in like 10 after, maybe. And she's crying. And we're like, no, nothing to worry about. Shaq was actually on time. <laughs> yeah. Well, because she probably knew Shaq's not going to be there. Well, she, but, she, everybody loves Shaq, but. Yeah. Well, he was the call screener, really. So it was really not until the phones would start ringing, which a lot of times was until the second hour when we would really get going. Games and then we would and, do the games. Guests. Yeah. But, you know, Shaq so. also would participate in our conversations. Yep. He was, he was a super smart guy. really loved him. And he would get involved with the guests and. We were really lucky in that regard that we had some wonderful people. We were really super lucky yeah. with who we had on our team, and they liked working with us, too. He loved that King's Sweet Hawaiian Bread. Ah, he used to bring up a loaf yes. of that and eat it. <laughs> the other thing he loved, which I found, which I don't think you love so much, but because I always said we did it before Ellen, when we would go to break and we would play a song and we would we would kind of dance around the studio and laugh, but the, when I, my knee wasn't bad. But... Um, <laughs> Katie loved the Shania Twain, uh, Man, It Feels Like a Woman, and so did Shaq. Shaq yeah. loved that song, too, for whatever reason. Would play it a little longer. You'd be like, you're digging into our talk time. You're digging in. It's like, enjoy the song. Enjoy yeah, the they, song. Well, they used to let that breathe. That's what they call it. They would let it play in the daily breathe. Katie loved yeah. that song. And I I remember one day, I think I'd, I posted on Facebook about it. I was at the grocery store, and it was a Saturday, and it came on the radio, and I cranked it up, and I laughed, and it immediately took me back to the studio with the four of us. Mm -hmm. But uh, good yeah, we days. Had, we had some fun yeah. days in that studio, that's for sure. Fun days and not so fun days, but fun interviews, tough interviews. <laughs> yeah. 
I just was recounting stories of those recently. Again, you had to fill the air, right? You had to fill uh-huh. the time. And if yeah. you had a dud and you had to have them, we made the mistake of, of booking them for too long, probably. When you think about uh, it. Yes, you should have said, yeah, you're on for five minutes. And then if it went to 20, you'd be okay. But when you are obese, <laughs> you shop with other obese women at Lane hey, Bryant. Bryant. Deceased Gene Nightage, founder of Weight Watcher. Is that one almost put us over the edge? Wonderful I was woman. sweating. The problem with you is when I when I, I get like that, I can't look at you, and then I start to I, sweat. And I keep trying to look at you. I know, which you, I can't because I won't be able to. And there, <laughs> we had that with the the guy with the horrible stutter. We had it with uh, what what all? What's my type? The yeah, typographer. What's my type? John, wide open. Nobody wants them. Uh, Tim, Nobody wants Tim's about. first question. So, what would your favorite typeface be? <laughs> Palatino, and then Tim just turns the chair. I got forty-five away. minutes of this, and I start breaking out in a sweat. Sweat, cold and sweat. Then yeah. the other guy that wrote the book about. And, oh, they, what did he say? He was. Um, he had uh, ADD severe, or something. Severe he, autism. It doesn't and like he direct questions. Asked direct questions. Yeah. And he's on. You're here in an show. interview. <laughs> Sell your book. Where's the publicist? <laughs> Yeah. Get her in here. <laughs> Again, that was master. one of those days though where you never ever used the restroom. And you happened to use the restroom that day and left me in there with him. And I start saying, here because you usually would do the here's how it works, here's where yeah. the mic is. So I'm going through your checklist of things. And then he puts his hand up. Uh just want to let you know that I don't really like direct questions. And uh then Katie's like, five seconds, the door flies open, you're like, hello. And you sit down. <laughs> I'm looking at you like, what do I do? You're staring right at me like laser beams. <laughs> like he doesn't want us to ask him questions. <laughs> mm-hmm. Classic, classic. Yeah, but you know, that's, that's or the mixologist that came with no vodka. Oh, that was the best one. Drunk came right from the bars. Probably came right from a, a night, a whole ten a.m. in the morning, an all nighter came in, and, and we're, we're drinking did... Virgin Bloody Marys, and someone calls it, and they're like, "I wonder what Ooh. that tastes like if it's a Virgin Bloody Mary." I'm like we're sure it's delicious. Yeah. That was the same guy. He was representing a famous brand that marketed to the LGBTQ consumer, and he ended up picking the cheap vodka. Remember, we were doing yeah. a taste test with him too. And he picked the Taka Vodka. <laughs> Taka Vodka, three dollars out of New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. <laughs> That's a really tasty one. We're like, hmm, okay. <laughs> the rubbing alcohol you're selling didn't make the cut. <laughs> so anyway, well, Mr. Nash, what uh, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. You'll appreciate this. I think you will, at least. Um, (laughs) Because it goes to my roots as a sci-fi nut. Headline reads, Long Lost Model of the Enterprise Has Potentially Been Found. So, um, years ago when they were filming the original Star Trek series at Desilu, there was an 11-foot model of the Enterprise, the original ship, that now hangs at the Smithsonian Institute, the Air and Space Museum down in uh, D.C., and there was a three-foot model, which had been built for press releases and stuff like that, and used to sit on Gene Roddenberry's desk. Gene Roddenberry bought, let the model go to Paramount Studios for reference when they were making the movie Star Trek The Motion Picture, and then it kind of vanished. Turns out it was put into a packing crate and just packed away. And here we are 40 years later. Someone gets the packing crate. It comes out. And they list it on eBay, not knowing what the hell the damn thing is, oh right? So it goes up on eBay, model of the Enterprise, blah, blah, blah. A whole, and it had a starting price of a thousand bucks. This thing is potentially priceless because this is an original prop and it used to sit on Gene Roddenberry's desk, the, the Great so Bird of the Galaxy. So it a prop that they would use on the show? So They, they did use it for some filming, but primarily right, okay. it was for the actors to hold or it was like one of those props they would have when they did PR shots and stuff. So... A bunch of eagle-eyed model builders and and people who love the show found this on eBay and they did a whole bunch of research and they realized based on the photography that this had to be the three-foot model that Gene Roddenberry lent Paramount Pictures 40 years ago or maybe even longer um, or less than that. But so um, they actually contacted the seller and the eBay listing was suspended or is that like they did this thing where they said um sale ended and then it just vanished because wow. they contacted uh rod roddenberry gene roddenberry's son and they're hoping that this finds his way that the model finds its way back to gene roddenberry's family and uh so there you go <laughs> i mean it's just kind of wow. an oddball thing the the model that they sh- i have here on the youtube picture was actually it was used in a um the original uh, pilot for star trek called the cage 
So if you've seen pictures of the, whenever you see the Enterprise in the cage, uh, which was repurposed as a two-parter called the Menagerie, that's this original three-foot model. So I love when things like this pop up, movie memorabilia, or things that just get lost. Because I think what people forget is when they make movies, they make it and then it's over. Yep. Uh, sometimes a prop could be like a piece of cardboard, you know, it's like it, whatever looks good on camera. So things don't always last, right? No, oh, even did. even when I was doing TV commercials, you know, you, you the wardrobe, everything would be either packed away or sent away or given away, yeah. or thrown away. You know, they didn't they didn't keep a lot of that stuff. I I have a question for you in this Star Trek. Did they um how did did these machines run on on jet fuel? How did these things get around? You mean in the fictional world of Star yeah. Trek? Yeah. They run on something called dilithium crystals. Where do those come from? Dig them up? They get mined in planets that are rich with dilithium. So do you pull in, do you pull into a di, what did you call it? Dilithium. Did you pop, pull into a dilithium station and get loaded? You, you know, you had to have the crystalline, this, this crystals had to be restructured or replaced now and then, usually at a star base. <laughs> See how far afield this is going? Okay. <laughs> I just. <laughs> I just wondered, as I said, I never saw anybody eat or drink or go to the bathroom on these science fiction no, movies. No, bathrooms. no yeah, bathrooms. They did eat sometimes. Did they have a pill? You'd have a pill and that would satisfy yeah. you for the, for the quarter or for the year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sounds like, well, well I, could, I could do that. My, um, <clears throat> I wonder what they're going to do with it. You think they're just going to try to get it back to... Um, I think they're, they, the home. intent is to get it back to the Roddenberry family as yeah. you know, part of their heritage and memorabilia. I don't know what they're going to do with it once they have it, but... It's surprising to me that somebody, as the way people are, that someone didn't didn't uh, buy it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it was. So kudos for the people that were fans who discovered to, it on eBay. Right? Yeah, because most people would not have been so charitable. I don't think. The um, my story cannot be any any different, and I actually had to research it to make sure it wasn't uh, a fake story, and um, apparently not. So I'll just read the headline: Ritz Carlton guest sues hotel after staffer served her semen contaminated water lawsuit says so vita vita vegemin so vita tasty vita, too. so tasty too vita vita. so a woman was staying at the ritz carlton with her husband celebrating their 25th anniversary and it was at the ritz carlton outside of san francisco and uh rooms start at 800 a night and anybody who knows the ritz knows it's uh you know quite a, Not quite a, a nice place. place right this is a five-star ritz at the half moon bay and this happened last november and they're just getting around to the lawsuit now the um so she said she was, uh, she's just identified as Jane Doe and her husband as John Doe. And so Jane Doe was sleeping and uh, she, she was thirsty. So she called room service and ordered bottled water. Now, you know, Ritz Carlton, if you're watching the thing, they, they have their own bottled water there. Private label. Private label. Yeah, they just slap their label on it. So she has the water and she has it on her nightstand. She says she woke up during her four night stay and took a sip from the hotel branded water in the middle of the night and quote realized that the taste and texture of the water that she had ingested may have been semen <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there but continue <laughs> she's a she's a keeper yeah. so um so, <laughs> loads of practice you know so the um so she was mortified and terrified and embarrassed and humiliated she said so all at the woke, same time right she woke her husband up she, she told her husband what happened and uh so they call down to the front desk. She makes a big scene. She calls the police, they said. So the hotel subsequently gets a hold of the bottle, and they take it to a laboratory for analysis, and they confirm that the water did contain semen. Wow. But they will not give the bottle back to her or to her attorney. And so the state's claim adjuster as well for the, Mar or the, the claims adjuster for the Marriott has also confirmed that the bottle did contain the semen. However, they're not sure where it came from. In other words, you can't necessarily blame it on the worker. And so there, she wants a list of everyone who was working, wants DNA checked, wants a DNA checked in the bottle. It's going down this road of this whole thing. So the police department wants none of this. They don't want any involvement in this, and they didn't even show. But apparently the, the uh, Ritz-Carlton has possession of the bottle, and they're not giving it up to the attorney. <laughs> And so she's, um, so they're now, you know, suing and she says that she's, um, let's see, she says there was an actual quote here. It says, uh, they're suing for sexual battery, intentional, intentional inflict, infliction of emotional distress, negligence and the loss of consortium and, uh, are seeking a jury trial. 
So consortium or consortium, as you say, is the lack of a companionship. In other words, she was so traumatized she can't have sex with her husband. So, um, wow. so I, I immediately went okay. to the comments section. Of course, Ritz Carlton has no comment. So I went yeah. to the comments section there, and half the people shockingly believe her story. The other half think it's made up and they're just trying to extort money. Um, one of my favorite lines, which I just used, somebody says, how did she know what it was right away? She must have loads of practice. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> but what I couldn't figure out, and this is where a number of people also said, if you order, if you have a bottle of water anywhere, you get a bottled water. Usually you open it and you feel the snap, you know, the yep. of the, of the, um, the, of the cap of the cap. And people are saying, oh no, somebody could have glued it. Somebody could have done this. Somebody could have done that. But if I had anything that felt like it wasn't, it had already been opened, I wouldn't drink it, would you? If you had, if yep. you were at a hotel and there was bottled water in your room and you went to undo the cap and realized the cap had been open, whether somebody just filled it with tap water or whatever, you probably wouldn't consume it. No, I wouldn't. I agree. And I also want to say, if there happened to be a male uh, semen in there, wouldn't the water have also not been clear? Correct. There would have. It would have been, yeah. Okay. So I'm not so sure I believe her story. Now they say, oh, it was late at night and she grabbed the bottle and she just opened it and they just delivered it to the, you know, there was all these caveats of what happened. But a number of people think they're just trying to, to extort money out of the hotel. Well, so the I, hotel tried to appease them, gave them a couple nights points, gave them a few points uh, on their Marriott, uh, <laughs> Marriott right, but, points. But the, the charges and the, the, the lawsuit they want to file, I mean, I, I've not heard, like, it's almost a stretch, right? Like, you know... Um, the fact that she can't be intimate with her husband because of the water, like it's kind of like, you know, you could, you could sue for negligence, I suppose. But beyond that, what are they, you know, I don't know. Oh, people sue for crazy things. You know that it says here, she, she was really upset. The attorney says that uh, the Marriott or the Ritz Carlton owned by the Marriott says they only offered her a few measly Marriott reward points, which could only be used for another anxiety inducing stay at the Ritz. <laughs> Drink up. So, yeah, um, Taste, yeah. ta so tasty, it's too. It's so tasty, too. Tastes just like candy, honest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, so I don't know. What do you think of this one? Do you think it's made up or do you think it's true? Even if it's not made up, talk about going overboard. It's just, it's not going to kill her. It wasn't like someone put cyanide <laughs> in the bottle, right? It's, well, she wanted to know. She said she might have a disease, might have a sexually transmitted no, disease. And no, a whole bunch no, of stuff. and no. As my doctor used to always say, if people got sick from drinking drinking that, we'd all be sick, right? Well, I wondered if maybe her husband did it. <laughs> I had that thought too as you were reviewing the story. I thought, I wonder if uh, middle of the night he's like in the bathroom, like, yeah, I get spiker yeah, spiker her, water, her babe. Yeah. So that was it. So uh, be careful at the Ritz if you get bottled water. I guess mm -hmm. is the, the motto of that. The, uh, hey, many of you know that, uh, <laughs> this is an uncomfortable segue, Deep Discount, <laughs> a friend of ours here on the Focus Group, they've, they've been with us uh, for quite some time. We appreciate their support of our show. Uh, be sure to find out about them when you go to focusgroupradio.com and click on their logo and start shopping away. We appreciate you getting there by going through our site because we get, we get credit for that. They've got a site-wide sale going on right now, Mr. Nash, and so uh, what did you find for us this week? Site-wide winter sale is one of our favorites, and I do have a recommendation for listeners. It's a movie that many of you might have seen. It uh, came out in uh, 1998. It's uh, called Dark City, and it stars Rufus Sewell, Kiefer Sutherland, Jennifer Connelly, um, William Hurt's in it. It's It's got an interesting cast. It's sort of this... It's like a... I want to say it's like a noir mystery, but it ends up being sci-fi, and the ending is super trippy in its own way. But you, it, it's just, it's like a, so it's like a film noir in a sci-fi setting with a dystopic or kind of crazy premise to it. I enjoyed it a great deal. The reason I'm recommending it is because this is the director's cut, and the director's cut always includes a couple of scenes that the director really believed in, but the studio didn't. Wow. <laughs> so. Um, the director of this movie is Alex Proyas, and he did iRobot and The Crow, so he's known to a lot of people in the sci-fi uh, realm. Um, it, it includes enhanced picture and sound, never-before-seen footage, and a couple of commentary tracks. So my pick is the Dark City Director's Cut on Blu-ray, and it's uh, 1066. Wow. I, um, I Are you putting some... that on your list, right, Tim? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think I already have it. I... Um... <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I don't have this one either, so I'm going to have to ask you about this. So, and you know, Matthew Perry had died um, mm -hmm. from Friends, and so as I was going through the, the list of the site-wide sale, this had popped up, and I must confess, I never was, I never really watched Friends. Did you watch it? We did, but you know, the thing about Friends was while Friends was going on, we were living that same life at that same age. So we were going not out all the time. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was the same way. So I, I never really watched uh, Golden Girls. I never watched Friends. I never watched uh, Will and Grace the first go around. Yeah. Uh, I didn't watch a lot of TV. The only thing I remember kind of paying attention to toward the end was Seinfeld. But otherwise, yeah, we were out and about. You know, we yeah. were, I'd go to Tower Records rather than sitting home watching TV Ditto. or something. Yeah. But this had popped up, and I thought in honor of, of Matthew Perry, what was interesting about this Friends collection here, it says it's called Friends, the one with all the holidays collection. So what, what they've done here, this was released last November, is uh, they've taken all of the episodes that had the special holidays around them. So if there was a Thanksgiving theme show or a Halloween theme show or Christmas theme, New Year's, so they took all the holiday shows and put them on one holiday collection for Friends, which I thought was interesting because um, a lot of times these shows never in syndication run again, or you can't find them on on some of the the series because they were one offs of just the, yep. the holiday time. So this actually does take all of the um, all of the holiday shows from the run of Friends and puts them on one DVD, and you can get it for uh, twelve dollars and seventy eight cents on on DVD which uh, I thought was a pretty darn good price. Given the number of seasons that Friends had and the yep. number of holiday-themed shows, it's a great collection, I think, if you're a Friends fan. And, you know, I watch Friends now, and I laugh, and I, but, you know, I, as you said, not when it was airing originally, so it lives on. It's a good pick. Well, it's a good way, it's a good way you frame that. As, as, as that show was on, we were kind of living the same, same life, life in the cities, <laughs> you know, out and about and doing, doing this and that. So, and, uh, so what was the new release this week? New release is a movie called Gran Turismo. I'm going to read the description to you. I heard about it when it came out. Gran Turismo is based on the unbelievable true story of a team of unlikely underdogs, a struggling working-class gamer, Archie Mataqua, a failed former race car driver, David Harbour, and an idealistic motorsport executive, Orlando Bloom. Together, they risk it all to take on the most elite sport in the world. Gran Turismo is an inspiring, thrilling, and action-packed story that proves that nothing is impossible when you're fueled from within. So, obviously, it's a story about motor car racing. It comes out in 4K Ultra HD. I think I'd like to see it myself. Um, you know, the last one I saw was the one about the Ford versus the Ferrari, which I enjoyed a great deal. So, I might watch this. Cool. I haven't so, there you go. So, I folks, just to recap for you. You you want you're gonna watch it too, Mister? No, or? I said I haven't seen. I didn't see the Ford one either. I didn't. Ford Ferrari is a good that. one. Yeah. yeah, it's a good one. Um, to recap for you, it's a site wide sale at our partner Deep Discount. Um, everything's on sale site wide: vinyl, movies, CDs, books, toys, you name it. Go down the rabbit hole by visiting focusgroupradio.com and clicking on their logo. You won't be sorry. I picked a movie that I loved seeing when it first came out called Dark City. This is the director's cut. Tim picked. Friends, the one with all the holidays. It's a collection of all their holiday shows. And if you're a big fan of Friends and with the recent passing of Matthew Perry, might be good to check out on that one. And the release this week is Gran Turismo. So uh, thank you, Deep Discount. We are going to uh, take a quick break. And when we come back, we have a business birthday and a shop talk. So stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now back to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. back to the focus group now in our 15th year you say with confidence i think it's 15 <laughs> 15 16 15 16 uh learn more about us at focusgroupradio.com while you're there be sure to uh click on either the focus group and you can find all of our shows housed there previous shows that you can download or listen to as well as our podcast which is tfg unbuttoned 
and uh, be sure to like and follow us as well while you're there. You know, people, tr you, you try to get all these follows and likes. I was reading about all this stuff and people on TikTok and all these other places. And, uh, you know, everybody's still trying to hoof it to get these likes and follows. But, you know. I don't, I, I don't like and follow a lot of things, but I listen to and watch a lot of things. So yeah. it's just, yeah. Well, it's funny the amount of people that we have that um, tell us they watch or listen or have, you know, will parrot back something. And But th it, you're exactly right. They haven't followed anything. They don't like anything, but yeah. they, they listen. So anyway, thanks for listening. The um, business birthday this week, as you know, we're the only show in the universe that does business birthdays. So uh, without further ado. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So Milton Bradley was born on this day, November such a great 8th. One, Tim. 18... This is such a great one. Yeah, Milton Bradley, 1836, he was born, a year after my college was, was chartered. So it's quite some time ago. An American business magnet. I don't know quite know why they called him that, but he was a game pioneer and publisher. He's credited with launching the game board industry. And uh, particularly with a game called Life. Mm -hmm. Remember? Did you ever play Life? Yeah, we had it as kids. Yeah. I thought everybody had it. No, I don't think we had it. I might have been too highbrow for our house. <laughs> okay. I don't know. But he, you know, but uh, over the years, they had things like Operation and Battleship and Monopoly, all the, the games Clue. That came, out of, came out of Milton right. Bradley. Oh, no, a Clue was Parker Brothers. Yeah. That's another one. Okay. But uh, Milton was born in Vienna, Maine. Uh, to Lewis and Fanny. Anybody name their kid Fanny anymore? I was thinking about that. No, those are all the old names, right? Fanny Nash, Fanny Bennett. Maybe we can yeah. do a Fanny. The, uh, they said he grew up in a working class household. The family moved to Massachusetts where he finished high school. Then they moved to Hartford, Connecticut, and then ended up in Springfield, Massachusetts, where he worked as a mechanical draftsman. And uh, from there, he had made his way over to Providence, Rhode Island, and he learned uh, lithography. And um, so he <laughs> he worked for a lithograph shop there and and ended up creating a real mess. They said he um, he decided he was going to print an image of a little known presidential nominee named Abraham Lincoln. And so he had uh, he was printing these uh, these pictures of Lincoln that they were going to sell. And they initially met with great success, but then customers started demanding the money back because when they actually saw uh, Abe Lincoln, he had a beard. And the pictures he was selling, <laughs> Abe Lincoln had no beard. No beard, yeah. <laughs> so he had all of these prints he had done that were worthless, and people were wanting their money back. And so it ended up, he had uh, essentially put him out of business. It broke him and, um, because everybody wanted their money back. And so he ended up with all these worthless prints and ended up having to burn them as well. And uh, but they said this led him to um, decide to develop a board game based upon an imported game a friend of his had shared with him from England, and uh, he released what was at the time in 1860 the game the checkered game of life, which became the game of life. So he made his way to New York for uh, to try to sell this, and uh, in two days he sold um, sold out his first run of several hundred copies of the board game. And then uh, in 1861, he sold 45,000 copies of the, of the board game. <laughs> That's a success. Right. So it became quite popular. And um, they said the big difference um, with the game is that many games uh, in the U.S. were structured around morality and structured mm -hmm. around the Puritan ethic um, about moral, Get ahead, uh, work mor hard. moral virtue. And this game, was, this game, they said, part of the success here was that it depicted life as a quest for accomplishment with personal virtue and and as a means to the end rather than the moral virtue. So they said this also complemented America's burgeoning fascination with obtaining wealth and with the casual relationship between character and wealth around the Civil War. They said it was also, uh, Americans were also getting an increasing amount of leisure time, which they never really had because they always were working, um, particularly in agricultural uh, society. So, um, they landed at the right time with these games. And they said, uh, as the company, um, as the company grew, as we mentioned, the game of life, easy money, candy land, operation and battleship. I loved and, operation. Would you know where operation came from? No. So I looked it up and they said it was a very popular, um, carnival game. 
mm. that they would have this loop wire and you had to go in. It was skill for eye hand coordination. Nation, yeah. And um, so he had taken this large carnival game where you would have to go in with like a pliers to pull something out and made it down to, uh, to, to tweezers. That, to tweezers. Yeah. To get, you can never get one of those bones out. There was one you could never get out. Funny bone that? was hardest, I thought. Yeah, it always, zzz, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the, light, the nose lit up, right? <laughs> you know, you'd always lose. The other thing that he was very famous for, which I had no idea, is that um, he had a fascination with kindergarten, um, which uh, I did not know was actually um, developed in German in, in Germany. So in terms of uh, developing youth and developing uh, child, uh, child learning, the Germans had put together this kindergarten, which I guess is where the that makes the sense. Word kinder, right? Kinder, right? Yeah. And so he had really taken a fascination um, aside from the games. He spent an awful lot of time trying to figure out how he could bring this uh, method of learning and child development to the U.S. that the Germans were doing. So the Milton Bradley Company had a side business where they would standardize colors, and uh, for kids in terms of how to educate them and learn. So they started first with watercolor sets. You don't think about this stuff, I guess. No. So they would standardize the color of watercolor sets. He also was the first to release crayon packages with standardized colors. They said this was a forerunner to Crayola. And uh, also art supplies. He said it was this interest in art education led him to produce a new color wheel as well. And he published four books about teaching color to children. Hmm. So he said before then it was very difficult because there was no standardization of colors. And so he went down this route of saying, well, let's do the primary colors and let's teach the kids. And if I produce enough of these books or uh, watercolor sets and uh, crayons and so forth, kids will be able to learn color. Clever. So, yeah. So that's how that happened. He died at uh, 74 years old. He's buried in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, he was finally in 2004 inducted into the Toy Industry Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, okay. And uh, also the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Company sold, um, so Milton Bradley was sold to Parker Brothers, and then it was sold to Hasbro, and uh, which it still is now located there in uh, Rhode Island as part of the Hasbro company with all the games uh, still being produced. They said the operation game brings in about 50 million a year still. Just that game? Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine? I can. <laughs> yeah. We got to come up with a game. I'm glad it's still. St I'm glad it's still sold. Actually, yeah. I uh, my niece my nieces had had it, and uh, I could not get the darn. You know, it doesn't seem the way it was when we were little. Maybe they maybe the things have gotten cheaper. I don't know. Yeah, I told you before. I once uh, had a doll when I was a kid called Major Matt Mason. He was like a posable, you know, right. the wire inside a rubber figure. I rebought him on eBay. For memory's sake, I arrived in a you know the box you get your replacement checks in that yep. little box, that, and I put the doll in my. The thing looks so small. And I remember calling my mom. I'm like, I got this major Matt Mason. I don't know if it's real because it's. You know, oh, honey, look at your hand. Look at my hand. She goes, imagine your hand half the size. It's just that's. I'm like, oh, okay, it's real. <laughs> did you think it was think, really that small though? I, yeah, because I'm I'm with you on that. I guess right. I do. I do. I think we were that small. Yeah. Yeah. So, huh. Do you still have that doll? I do, I do. Is he on, is he on your your shelf? He's on my or shelf. In the, in the, uh, sometimes, if you if I'm doing something in the office, you'll see him in the background with his little with his <laughs> little. Have to move around the house like Elf on the Shelf. Yeah, uh, to, <laughs> yeah, that's a move good him around idea, for Bob actually. for Bob to find him. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so happy birthday, Milton Bradley. The um, our shop talk this week. John had found this. It's a it's a short article, but the uh, the headline says your brain doesn't work the same on Zoom scientists say. So there was some uh, research done by a Yale professor, and they talked about how um, the difference between the interaction or how um, our brains are different when you speak with somebody on Zoom versus being face-to-face -face with them. And I think a lot of it's based upon not being able to pick up uh, clues, right, or, or mm -hmm. cues from them. And um, this opened up a lot of other questions for me, but before I ask them of you, what did, what did you think of, of oh, this? Oh, I think uh, this is fascinating. I had read an article similar to this about two years ago where scientists had determined that brain activity also decreased, or we don't use as much of it when we right. were doing some of these Zoom calls. Um, and the article, you could it, it, it's a, they said here, it suggests that there is still something fundamentally lacking about speaking with someone else, with someone online. 
People's faces are not able to light up people's brains in the same way the researchers suggested. Um, so neurological activity actually decreases when you're doing a Zoom call or a FaceTime as opposed to when you're face-to-face. And the more they dug into the data, they realized that there's a lot of things going on when we are face-to-face with someone. There's social cues, and, and our, our brains are, are literally lighting up with the idea of processing all these things because they right. actually contribute to the conversation. This isn't surprising to me. Um, I, I <laughs> you know, some now there are days when people say, do you want to hop on a Zoom call? I'm like, I'm fine with a phone call. You know, I still right. think we can get nuance through the phone call, but I'm not a big fan of the video stuff. Um, so they said later on, they said the study also suggests that face to face encounters remain extremely important, even as technology companies, and others come up with ways for us to interact online. I think anecdotally, Tim and I have talked about this a couple times on the show and in private. Um, It just feels different. And and I I actually get off a Zoom call and I feel tired and drained often. And that's because we have to use different parts of our brain to interpret what we're watching and hearing at the same time because we're not picking up on these nonverbal cues. So interesting piece. Well, then sometimes if you're doing a presentation as well, you can't see. Then you can't see people's reaction. I was I was going to ask you. So we have a client that we work with, and um, I've only met met him via Zoom. Yep. And so I have my impression of of him via Zoom. And I'm wondering, you've met him both in you know via Zoom and in person. <laughs> Great question. And so, do you find it is it different when you're with him in person versus? Yes, it is. Zoom? It is. Um, it's the person you've met on Zoom is the right. is the person. You're not you're not being misled. That's there's an energy level there. There's there's behavioral things, you know, like little gestures the person makes, but it's plussed up when you're sitting in front of him for right. lunch or you're getting together for a drink or something. It's and 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 because it's not a structured kind of work Zoom call, uh, it go he can go off in different directions, and you're starting like it's uh, movies or music, and you're laughing your butt off, and then you're back to talking. So it's just different. So it's, it's, right. it's you're getting the same person. But I'm getting the whole person, I guess is the way I would put it. Because I wondered, I also wondered if this holds true. So beyond the work, um, you know, the, the, the work function that they mentioned here with Zoom in terms of, of the workplace, I wondered if it was also the same if on some of these social apps where people are meeting uh, online mm. before they actually meet in person. Because you and I have often said if you meet somebody in person out, um, you can get a, a very different impression than if you just met them obviously over the screen so i wonder if it hold, held true for that as well that if somebody um had met on zoom whether they or or whatsapp or whatever those different um different social media outlets are if they did meet face to face if things would be different or they would have a different impression so you know i had read an article that uh, at the tail end of the pandemic a lot of people were dating quote unquote via facetime Right. which is kind of like Zoom. Um, and that uh, many times that was that was like a screening thing. They would meet and do his, like a Zoom date, and then they would continue or not. In light of this article and what you were just talking about, it seems to me that they were doing a great disservice because maybe people were rejected um, or passed over after the Zoom thing because you weren't getting the whole person. You weren't getting that in, that face-to-face right. thing that kind of lights you up, right? Well, this, I immediately thought of this. There's, there's two examples I had where I've, I've heard people, I, one I experienced myself and one I've, I've heard people mention. For instance, former President Clinton, they said if you were in a room with him or he was in a meet and greet, you thought you were the only person on the, on the earth. The way he, the way he interacted. Interacted, yeah. and it, which you wouldn't necessarily get if you just watched him on TV or news coverage or if he was giving a speech. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get that same impression, I don't think, if he was at a press conference. Um, but they said when he was in your presence in the room, you, it was very different. And even people who weren't a fan of his said there was something very magical about his his uh, ability to relate. And the one I had as as uh, for me is I had seen Annie Lennox a number of times live. And I've never seen a performer act as if she was singing to me, mm-hmm. which is sounds odd because there's no. thousands of people there or hundreds of people and you're in a in a theater. But the way she would engage an audience with her eyes and her mannerism is very different than if you just watch her sing on a concert on a that's video. been taped yeah. or on a video. 
And I thought, is it the same thing there? Is there something more that's going on between the face to face? And that's where I think this research is going, that there's something more that triggers the brain when you're, mm. you're face to face. But Andy Lennox was unbelievable. They said, I've never seen him, but they said David Bowie had the same sort of um, effect on people as well. He also had that same connection connection with the audience. Yeah. Which, uh, I've never you know, your Bill Bowie. Clinton uh, example is brilliant. It, there's one thing that, that Bill Clinton also did. I don't know if you remember. You might have been the one that told me when he shook someone's hand, he would also gently touch Grab the their, elbow. Yeah, their elbow, yeah. and it was like cementing this connection. I saw him speak um, at uh, the Time Warner Center years ago during some one of the upfront events. I think it was for TV Land. In person, he. I, I, he commands a room. He, yeah. he had this electric personality. And I love the fact that you nailed Annie Lennox and David Bowie, two incredibly intelligent performers, too. Right. You know, so I think that their ability to connect with an audience uh, is also somehow a reflection of who, probably who they are as people. But the fact that you felt that she was like singing to you is, is really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was unbelievable. I remember sitting with my friend and we were just both blown away and we both said, wow. Because you both felt it? <clears throat> yeah. And, and there were hundred. I mean, it was a huge. It was the, uh, I believe, the Kimball Center in Philly. So it seats, you know, probably twelve hundred people or something. So it wasn't like we. Were, she was just singing to us, but there was just a. She connected with the the audience in a way that was just, um, which reminded me of this article. This is that they, they said there's something that triggers the neurological um, function. The brain, of the brain goes, yeah, lights yeah, up with lights another up. human being. So. Yeah, so it was a good that was a good pick, Mr. Nash. It, it's a short one, but it's also just I think one of those it's a cautionary article. I, I don't don't invest too much in some of this stuff or your impressions of people because there is science behind it that says you may not in fact be getting the right impression. <laughs> or you're getting Well a lot of times, you know, I as a recruiter I, I remember this and I learned that you might look at somebody immediately and think, eh, you're not interested or you might not be attracted to somebody if you were out, out at a bar. But then you start talking to them and it changes over mm -hmm. yep. you know a couple of minutes because for whatever reason there's something more to the person that um kind of the the book by its cover um original scan probably wasn't uh smart to do so i try to do that i try not to just look and make an immediate impression because um after talking with somebody or listening to them they have a very different feel there's a there's a, a person um ali willis do you know her I had, no. She she wrote. Um, I'll have to send you a couple of videos of her. But if you looked at her, you would have an immediate impression. But when she starts talking, she is so engaging. And um, she actually had had written uh, Earth, Wind, and Fires uh, September. <laughs> oh and, my God! Okay. And, uh, and and also wrote the theme for Friends. Okay. Um, although she does, she can't write music. So it was kind of like you know, it's it's to go like this. Da 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 da. da you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. She, she's a character. I'll send you a couple of videos. Please, but yeah. She recently passed away, and I've become fascinated with her now because she's another one of those people that you look at and you're like, hmm, and then you listen to her and you're like, wow, I would love to have dinner with her. I would have loved to have known her. So. It's what you alluded to when you said don't judge a book by its cover yeah. because you want to read the book. And suddenly well, if you and I saw her in the street, we'd think she was a bag woman, <laughs> you know? And and But then you listen to her, you're like, oh, my God, this woman's brilliant, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, it's a good article. And as again, folks, um, Zoom is Zoom. So thanks for uh, joining us today on the Focus Group. We want to remind you to visit focusgroupradio.com. You can see where the show is. It's on all our platforms are listed there, including our partners, which is Deep Discount. And uh, they're having a site-wide sale. We uh, talked about some titles that Tim and I wanted to pick up. I think I, mine was Dark City. And yours was a friend's collection of holiday shows. Yep. And the uh, new release this week is Gran Turismo. Or Turismo. Let me make sure I got that right. You got it right. It is Gran to me. <laughs> Gran Turismo. So we like to say here on the focus group, it's like a broken record. Don't text and drive. Arrive alive. Uh, we want you to arrive safe at your destination and stay safe and have a great week. And we'll see you in the new one. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.